And I call on Michael Russell. John. Uh, Presiding officer, thank you for the opportunity to make this statement. It's not typical for a minister to come to this chamber and tell members that they regret the introduction of legislation, but that is the situation in which I find myself today. I do regret that the Scottish Government now feels compelled to introduce the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. I regret it because it's about preparing for an event, the UK leaving the European Union, that I don't wish to happen which is, of course, contrary to the wishes of the majority of the Scottish people, 62% of whom voted to remain in the EU. And I regret it because it never needed to come to this. Presiding officer, it's important to set out how we have reached this situation and what the options are now before us. When the UK government published its EU withdrawal bill in July last year, it was no surprise that its approach to devolution was careless and lacking in understanding. After all, since June 2016, the devolved institutions, including this government and this parliament, have been denied any meaningful input into the Brexit process, despite the clear and agreed terms of reference of the JMCEN, of which I am a member. There was no consultation on the content of this bill prior to us seeing it in finished form two weeks before its publication. That was contrary to all good and established practice with bills that are going to require legislative consent from this parliament. We would have been justified when the bill was published in walking away from such a burach. But instead, and I pay tribute to all the parties in this parliament, as a parliament, we have put a great deal of time, resource and effort into trying to make it a workable piece of legislation to which we could all agree. Presiding officer, no matter how much we oppose Brexit, a withdrawal bill is, and we have always made this clear, a proper and necessary step. Our laws must be prepared for the day the UK leaves the EU. If we did nothing, laws about matters such as agricultural support or the rules that ensure our high food standards would fall away entirely, and many others would stop working the way they were intended. However, the bill as drafted, and which has now been passed by the House of Commons, despite amendments proposed by the Scottish and Welsh governments and by the opposition parties, allows Westminster to take control of devolved policy areas in order, according to the UK government, to allow UK-wide arrangements or frameworks to be put into place after Brexit. It's important to stress this fundamental point before addressing the detail. This whole debate is about the existing powers of this parliament, powers in relation to policy areas such as farming, fishing, justice, and the environment, for which this parliament already has responsibility. The discussion about the way forward is therefore not an abstract or arcane one. It is first and foremost about protecting the devolution settlement that the people of Scotland voted for so decisively in 1997. But it's also about the best way to run important national and local services, like our health service. The best way to provide agricultural support, such as less favoured area payments, which are essential in Scotland, but not used in England. The best way to devise procurement rules that are tailored to Scottish need and Scottish business. And the best way to protect and enhance our particular environment, consisting as it does of large areas of coast and sea. At present in these islands, we have a unitary, but not a uniform market. With the freedom to innovate, we have brought forward world-beating climate change legislation, are in the process of implementing minimum unit pricing for alcohol, and have been able to tailor business support to specific business need. Of course, we've always been clear that we accept in principle the need for there to be UK-wide frameworks on some matters. We've been working constructively with the UK and Wales to investigate those issues and explore how such frameworks would work. The key priority for us, however, is to ensure that these are always in Scotland's interests, as this chamber would expect. Accordingly, what is covered by any UK frameworks, how they're governed, and any consequent changes to the devolution settlement must only be made with the agreement of this Scottish Parliament. It's simply not acceptable for Westminster to unilaterally rewrite the devolution settlement and impose UK-wide frameworks in devolved areas without our consent. That's why we and the Welsh Government have been working so hard to ensure that the EU withdrawal bill both protects devolution but also does the job it's supposed to do. Of course, presiding officer, opposition to the EU withdrawal bill as currently drafted extends far beyond the Scottish and Welsh Governments. This Parliament's Finance and Constitution Committee concluded unanimously that Clause 11, which constrains devolved powers, was, and I quote, incompatible with the devolution settlement, and importantly, that the clause was not necessary to enable the agreement of common frameworks. 
In the House of Lords, the former head of the UK Civil Service called the treatment of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland in the bill indefensible. Lord Hope, former Deputy President of the Supreme Court and the convener of the crossbench peers, even described the bill's approach to devolution as having a touch of Cromwell about it. He has also retabled the joint Scottish and Welsh Government amendments for consideration during the Lord's stages of the bill. And the Scottish Parliament's first presiding officer, Lord Steele, described how the bill threatened Scotland's stable and sensible form of government. Faced with such an array of views from all parties, the UK government did accept that the bill must change. But regrettably, despite its promise, it has failed to bring forward an amendment in the House of Commons, though last week it finally put a proposal on the table for the Lords. However, this new amendment to the bill would still allow the UK government to restrict the Scottish Parliament's powers unilaterally through an order made in the UK Parliament without requiring the consent of either the Scottish Parliament or the government. Under this latest proposition, set out publicly by David Liddington yesterday, the UK government would decide whether the Scottish Parliament's powers in relation to any area currently covered by EU law should be constrained or not. As a result, this new proposal remains unacceptable to both the Scottish and the Welsh governments. UK ministers insist we have nothing to worry about because they will consult the devolved administrations before deciding whether to constrain the powers of this parliament. Presiding officer, the track record on consultation is not encouraging. The UK government has failed to meet similar commitments to Scotland in relation to the whole Brexit process. And it's impossible to take seriously the UK government's argument that they need to constrain the powers of this parliament for economic reasons. It is frankly risible that UK ministers pursuing an economically disastrous hard Brexit say they must reserve the right to impose UK-wide frameworks in devolved areas for reasons of economic stability. But despite all this, presiding officer, there does remain a basis on which to reach agreement. And the Scottish government remains committed to that objective. The Scottish and Welsh governments will be meeting UK ministers next week to continue to discuss the changes that must be made. We will suggest amendments to the UK government's proposals that would make it work with, not against, devolution. However, as a government, we recognise the reality of the position we find ourselves in. If there is not a change in position by the UK government, we will be faced with legislation to which we cannot recommend that this parliament gives consent. And in that situation, we believe that the constitutional correct position, consistent with the devolution settlement, will be for the UK government to remove those matters not consented to from this bill and for this parliament to make its own provision in that regard. That is why we believe it's incumbent on the Scottish government to provide an alternative means of ensuring for areas of policy within the competence of this parliament, legal certainty and continuity in the event that the UK does leave the European Union. That is what the continuity bill which we have introduced today does. Similar steps are being taken by the Welsh Government, which published its own very similar continuity bill earlier today. My Welsh counterpart, Mark Drakeford, has just made a statement to the National Assembly of Wales, setting out his government's proposals. The continuity bill will, if passed, retain our EU-derived law and give the government and parliament the powers they need to keep those laws operating. It will assert this parliament's right to prepare our own statute book so that the same rules and laws will apply as far as possible after withdrawal. It has been introduced today to ensure that it can be put in place prior to the final passage of the EU withdrawal bill. That's essential if this parliament decides not to give the Westminster bill legislative consent. The Minister for Parliamentary Business has accordingly written to you, presiding officer, proposing an emergency timetable, which will be put to the Bureau and which I hope parliament will agree to later this week. That timetable proposes that all stages of the bill take place in plenary session, enabling all MSPs to participate. Members will also be able, if their committees so choose, to take evidence on the bill, and I will make myself available to any such committee at any time. The period of scrutiny will be shorter than normal, but there needs to be intense examination of the proposals, and the Scottish Government will do everything it can to enable that. Presiding officer, the continuity bill is contingency planning. It provides a sensible scheme for preparing devolved law for EU withdrawal. But if the EU withdrawal bill can be agreed, and if this parliament consents to it, the continuity bill will be withdrawn. And even if the continuity bill is passed by this parliament, it contains provisions for its own repeal. If a deal can be reached with the UK government, we would be able to come to parliament with a proposal to give consent to the EU withdrawal bill and repeal this one. 
Now, Presiding Officer, finally, let me turn to your statement on the Bill's legislative competence. The Chamber will, I'm sure, wish to know that the Presiding Officer has said that, in his view, the provisions of this Bill are out with the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament. He is entitled to that view, but we respectfully disagree. Indeed, I understand that the Welsh presiding officer has reached a different view to the Scottish Parliaments and has issued a certificate of legislative competence. The Scottish ministers are satisfied that it is within the powers of the Parliament to prepare for the devolved legislative consequences of the decision by the UK to leave the EU. We do not agree with the presiding officer's view that it is incompatible with EU law to legislate in anticipation of what is to happen when EU law no longer applies. EU law itself envisages that a member state may withdraw from the EU in an orderly manner conducive to legal clarity and certainty. Under the Scotland Act, we can only introduce bills into Parliament when we are so satisfied. For this bill, the Deputy First Minister has made a statement to that effect. And as the Ministerial Code makes clear, any such statement must have been cleared with the law officers. I can confirm, and the Ministerial Code allows me to confirm, that the Lord Advocate is satisfied that the bill is within the legislative competence of the Parliament. Accordingly, the Lord Advocate will be providing a written statement to that effect later today, and subject to Parliament's agreement, he will make an oral statement in this chamber on this bill tomorrow and be open to questions on it. To be clear about what this means, the presiding officer's statement on legislative competence does not in any circumstance prevent the Scottish Government from introducing or progressing any bill. By triggering Article 50, the UK Government has put the UK on a path which leads out of the European Union. As I have set out, we have a duty to protect and preserve those areas of EU law that are within the responsibility of this Parliament. If we do not make those preparations now and we cannot agree to the withdrawal bill, we would have to wait until we have already left. And EU law has stopped applying in Scotland before this Parliament took any necessary precautions. That would be an unacceptable basis on which to invite Parliament to do essential preparation. Article 50 has been triggered. Without a drastic change of circumstances, which of course many of us still hope for, regrettably it is more than likely that the UK is leaving the EU. This bill is a necessary response to that fact. We recognise that the bill is novel, but we should not be surprised in an event like EU withdrawal is giving rise to novel legal situations. This is the first time since the reconvening of the Scottish Parliament in 1999 that the government has introduced a bill when the presiding officer has not been satisfied as to legislative competence. We recognise that. We are mindful of what a serious moment it is. However, the fundamental point cannot be escaped. This issue is too important for it to be either my decision or that of the presiding officer whether this bill is passed. All of us in this chamber have a duty to debate this issue over the coming weeks. All MSPs can listen to the arguments and then collectively we can all decide if this bill should become law. It will be a decision not of the Scottish Government but of this, our National Parliament, and that is how it should be, and that is why we are bringing forward this bill. Presiding Officer, I began this statement by saying I regretted having to introduce this bill and I still believe so. I regret what appears to be the unfolding disaster of Brexit. In my active frontline political life, which has lasted for more than 30 years, I've never known a time of greater instability, nor a time in which it has been harder to predict what lies ahead. But the core issue for this Parliament is simple. Our primary duty is to serve the people of Scotland and protect their interests. It's our obligation, indeed it's our duty, to protect the devolution settlement the people of Scotland voted for. That's what we are endeavouring to do, despite all the difficulties. I welcome the cross-party agreement that has been on that substantial point. I hope it can continue despite the pressures upon it. And it is in that spirit that I make this statement to Parliament today. Thank you. The Minister will now take questions. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank the Minister for early sight of his statement and Mr Finlay for even earlier sight of what was likely to be uh, in it. Um, in the Scottish Conservatives' view, uh, Presiding Officer, this bill is both unwelcome and unnecessary. But I want to start with where we agree. We all agree that withdrawal from the European Union will require a significant rewriting of large parts of our statute book. We all agree that the EU withdrawal bill, which undertakes this task, is deficient 
and requires to be amended to bring it into line with devolution in the United Kingdom. We also, all of us, have welcomed what until now has been the constructive and mature approach adopted by both the Scottish and the United Kingdom governments in the negotiations to fix the withdrawal bill so that it is fit for purpose. A fix is within reach. Both governments have compromised and have indicated that agreement is close. Not there yet, but close. This is the climate of constructive, serious engagement in which the SNP now introduces a continuity bill. And this is the reason why we on these benches consider its introduction today to be both unwelcome and unnecessary. In that light, presiding officer, let me ask the minister the following specific questions. First, what reassurance can he give the chamber that his government's continuity bill will help and will not hinder the speedy resolution of the negotiations with the UK government on amending the withdrawal bill? Second, what can he say about the way in which the SNP has shared its proposals for a continuity bill with the UK government, or indeed with opposition parties, although perhaps I should ask that question to Mr Finlay, in advance of publication? Mr Russell repeated in his statement a few minutes ago his familiar complaint that the UK government did not consult him on the withdrawal bill. In evidence to the Finance Committee, Mr Russell told me that he would share the continuity bill with UK ministers in advance of its publication. Did he? Or is that another broken promise? Finally, presiding, finally, presiding officer, the continuity bill is plainly a constitutional matter. When legislating on the Constitution, if indeed it is within our legal competence to do that at all, we should proceed carefully and not in haste. Yet this bill is to be fast-tracked. How can the Minister think that fast-tracking constitutional legislation through this Parliament is an appropriate way to proceed? Minister, Michael Russell. Can I thank Adam Tompkins for those questions? Let me give him the positive answer, first of all. Uh, I can give him a, a reassurance that we <coughs> will continue to work to seek a resolution with the UK government. Uh, we are, however, in a position, as the Welsh government is in a position, where if we do not take this contingency step today, it will be too late to take it. Uh, I think we should be commended for our restraint in holding off so long, because we ha have held off because we've endeavoured to get a, a resolution. But the clock is ticking, and we now have to introduce this if we have any prospect of putting this in, in a way and in a timescale that is complementary to those parts of the EU withdrawal bill at Westminster which will relate to reserve matters, because this is how it will operate. If this bill is passed, and if this bill comes into operation as given royal assent, this bill will deal with domestic issues, with, 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 with um, devolved issues, and the, the UK bill will deal with reserved issues. So that is why the bill is constructed in the way it is, so that it can fit in uh, it, it neatly uh, to those concerns. So we are now at the stage that we have to do that. And therefore, whilst I accept that they, we should take our time in so doing, we also have to get this in place so that those two things can move together. So that's what we're endeavouring to do. In terms of sharing its proposals, I have to accept that trust is at a low ebb between ourselves and the UK. If you doubted that, you should have read the speech by David Liddington on Monday and the press coverage over the weekend. I do find going to the JMC on Thursday and being assured of the goodwill of the UK government and then being denounced on the front pages of the Telegraph and in a speech on, uh, on, on Monday to be perhaps not a trusting relationship. I am glad to say that a copy of this bill is now in David Liddington's hands. Perhaps he will look at it and consider whether the next best stage is to have a conversation about the small but significant gap which still exists in terms of negotiation, and not just between myself and him, but between the Welsh Government and, and him as well. And that is the issue, as I've indicated here, of agreement. We cannot simply be consulted on our powers. We have to agree or consent to the changes that are being proposed. That is a small matter, and I would urge Mr. Tompkins to urge his colleagues in the Tory party to make that small step. Neil Findlay.
Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement and offer uh, my apologies for my appalling keyboard skills, uh, Mia Culpa. Um, the government's uh, handling of the whole Brexit process has been shambolic from the beginning. The latest development uh, lies squarely with the failure of David Mundell and Ruth Davidson as Scottish Tory leader to deliver on commitments given to resolve issues around the devolution of powers coming from the EU. Uh, Mr Mundell and Ms Davidson gave clear commitments that outstanding issues around the transfer of powers would be resolved in the House of Commons and then whipped every single Scottish Tory MP to vote against Labour's amendment that would have delivered exactly that. Failure to resolve these matters in the Lords and David Liddington's wholly unhelpful speech yesterday have simply exacerbated the situation, playing into the hands of the SNP for whom Brexit becomes another ploy in their political strategy. President officer, Scottish Labour delivered on the devolution demands of the Scottish people and we will defend any attempts to undermine them from wherever they come. So given that we've only just had sight of the uh, presiding officer's statement, I have serious concern that we have a Welsh government able to present a competent bill to the Assembly, but that that is not the situation here. We want to find a workable solution to this situation. So will the Cabinet Secretary agree urgent cross-party talks, bringing in the presiding officer uh, and government and parliamentary legal officers to try and find a way through this. Um, if the presiding officer can't sign off this, what precedent does it set if the government proceeds? The Cabinet Secretary says we can, he can introduce the bill, but what happens thereafter? Um, how does the government seek to ensure full parliamentary scrutiny takes place within a, such a truncated and timescale? And what background work has been done today on the practicalities, not just of the bill itself, but the huge amount of work that would have to be done thereafter. And what additional budget would be required to ensure that the Scottish Government has the personnel and capacity to deal with the consequences of passing such a bill? President Officer, Scottish Labour supports the objective of the, uh, of the Scottish and Welsh Governments, but we want to ensure that proper parliamentary scrutiny takes place and that this situation is not exploited by parties for their own narrow party political advantage. Minister. Thank you, and can I... Can I say that the only moment that I've ever felt that perhaps the changes that I brought in as Education Secretary to the college system were a little more radical than I expected were the failure of Neil Kinley to, Finley to do a keyboard course that would allow him to send emails in a competent fashion. But there are many such courses and I'm sure we'll find a college to give him one. Um, let me address uh, Neil Finlay's concerns insofar as I can. The Lord Advocate will uh, be issuing a statement this afternoon and... Um, will be available for questioning in this chamber tomorrow. And I hope the questions that Neil Finlay uh, has uh, in terms of some of the legal issues can be resolved in that way. I am quite willing to sit down at any time to discuss cross-party the issues of this bill. Uh, that would be a question of whether the, the, the presiding officer and others wishes to do so. But I think we are where we are. There has been a statement from the presiding officer. This has been issued this afternoon. Uh, we are also in the position, as I've indicated, and I have here a, 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 some information that's come to hand in the last few minutes on the summary of legislative competence issues from the Welsh presiding officer, which I'm happy to provide to, to, to Neil Finlay. And there clearly is a difference of opinion here. Uh, the way to test that difference of opinion now is to move forward with the bill as we are allowed to do so and for the Chamber to consider passing that bill. Uh, it is, as Mr Finlay knows, and I've explained this to him, a, a matter of uh, time scale in terms of having to make sure that this bill is through before the EU withdrawal bill is through and the two are complementary with each other. So we don't have a great deal of flexibility and that's why we have tried to ensure that the whole Chamber is in, engaged in this process and the committees of the Parliament. I believe that there may be a lead and subsidiary committee, but if other committees, I'm sure, wish to, 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 to examine the position I'm putting forward or other ministers are putting forward, they would be welcome to do so. So we will work as hard as we can with all the parties across the chamber uh, to, to take forward this issue, to outline the issues, and to make sure that we're answering the questions. And uh, I hope those questions will continue to come from Labour, from the Tories and the Greens and the Liberals, and we'll be, do our best to go forward together as a parliament. Call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Tavish Scott. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The introduction of this bill is an absolutely necessary response to the Brexit crisis and to its incompetent mishandling by a UK government. Members of this parliament know very well that the UK government is already eyeing up 
the opportunities they see from deregulating, from breaking the promises that they've made on our social and environmental protections, a great many of which fall within the competence of this Parliament, not the UK Parliament in terms of Scottish matters. It falls to the responsibility of this government and our Parliament as a whole to make sure that we stand up against that power grab. And I would say, unlike Mr Russell, that the gap between what the UK government is offering and what should be acceptable is not a small one. It requires major change from the UK government. I'm pleased that we're going to see more than the minimum level of emergency legislation, legislation scrutiny. The first time that it was suggested that emergency legislation might be used, that the minimum scrutiny necessary would have been wildly inad in inadequate. We're now going to see nearly a month between introduction and stage three, and that must give us all the opportunity in this chamber and in our committees as well to consider the implications and the contents of this bill, because this should be about parliamentary control, not government control. In that context, will the minister tell us what he means when he says, if the EU withdrawal bill can be agreed and if parliament consents to it, the continuity bill will be withdrawn. Will he commit to us that the continuity bill will not be withdrawn without this Parliament's prior agreement to its withdrawal? We should not be left in a position where it's consent to the EU withdrawal bill or nothing. Minister. Yes, I will make that commitment. Uh, the, in fact, only up until stage one could the government withdraw the bill uh, without consent thereafter require the consent of the chamber. So I'll, I'll make that commitment. Um, I'm grateful for M Mr Harvey's points. I think many of them I would agree with. But I want to just make an additional point which may be helpful to him. Um, we've had to, uh, in the drafting of this bill, mirror the EU withdrawal bill as closely as possible to make them, uh, it and the UK bill fit together. But there are one or two differences, and one of them I know will be something that Mr Harvey will very much approve of, which is to reintroduce the Charter of Fundamental Rights and that will be in the Scottish Bill, and indeed copies of the Scottish Bill have been made available, I think, a few moments ago, so people have it. So there are some things that we could do in this bill that would certainly improve on the current situation, and we are, of course, open to others within the necessity to meet the timescale that we have. Tavish Scott to be followed by John McAlpine. Thank you, presiding officer, and can I thank the uh, minister too for the courtesy of uh, early sight of his uh, statement. It is certainly unfortunate that the governments of the UK have not agreed. This is not good. This is a sensitive and delicate process that strikes at the heart of the government, not just here in Scotland, but the entire UK. And it is also not satisfactory that we have no legal agreement on this continuity bill. Uh, the Scottish Government, I'm sure, will wish to expand on the legal basis for their position. Will the Government ensure, therefore, that in addition to the Lord Advocate's statement tomorrow, that there will be further opportunities for MSPs to fully scrutinise the Lord Advocate's opinion? And given what he said earlier about meetings next week, uh, what does he expect from those meetings, given the introduction of the Continuity Bill today? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I can't speak for the Lord Advocate, but I'm quite sure that he will want to make sure that he has a continued dialogue and will be available to, to have that dialogue, and he will be open to question uh, t tomorrow. And uh, I'm quite sure that his statement later today will begin to lay out the basis of, of his opinion. In terms of what I expect to take place uh, next week, well, I, I, I'd note uh, that the UK government is likely to publish its own amendment to the EU withdrawal bill without agreement from the devolved administrations on or around the 12th of March, we believe now. I think that's an action uh, which I'm not going to criticise, uh, and I hope they won't criticise our action in producing the continuity bill, because we are all taking the steps that we need to take, uh, given that there may not be an agreement. Um, I hope that does not distract from the process of trying to get an agreement, but we must be conscious of the fact that we must put in place contingencies. And if they are putting in place a contingency uh, of an uh, amendment to the UK withdrawal bill, which neither Wales or Scotland has agreed, and that is the situation, then I think we are more than entitled to publish our own and move forward in our own continuity bills, but recognizing that dialogue can, is necessary to continue. And that's where we are. I, my statements made that clear. I made that clear to Mr. Tompkins. I'm making it clear to Mr. Scott. We will continue to have discussions and uh, we, in, we will endeavor to, to do that next week. Uh, we, were, we are seeking at the present moment the right time to do that next week. John McAlpine to be followed by Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you. The minister has just explained that the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights will be included in the continuity bill when it's excluded uh, from the UK's EU withdrawal bill. 
Can I welcome that? And could the Minister give more details on how including the Charter in the Scottish Bill will help, for example, victims of discrimination and others whose rights are affected post-Brexit? Yes, the UK government believes and, and has said that it, 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 its view is that those protections afforded by the EU, EU Charter of Fundamental Rights are already guaranteed within existing UK law. Uh, many people do not believe that to be true, uh, and many people believe that many of the rights given in the Charter uh, will be diminished or eroded as a result of its removal. Um, I, I tend towards that view. Uh, and therefore I want to see the Charter maintained. And there are many things that the Charter does in terms of uh, stating rights which are useful and helpful to individual citizens uh, in many circumstances. I think that uh, lots of us have considerable fears about the possibility of substantial erosion of human and uh, workplace and, uh, and other rights as a result of leaving the EU. And I have to say reassurances to the contrary by Michael Gove do not uh, make me feel a great deal better. So I think it is better to have a belt and braces approach and having the Charter of Fundamental Rights in this bill is the right thing to do. Um, I'm sure the Lord Advocate will, will be happy to expand upon how that is to be done. You will have now a copy of the bill and you will be able to see the intentions in drafting uh, and I'm sure he will want to answer questions on that. Jackson Carlow to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Uh, since the Minister first brought this issue to the Chamber in September, we have been working with him and others uh, to seek to find a way forward uh, that will allow both governments to agree. Uh, can he confirm that it is the government's preferred option, and not just an option, but the government's preferred option, that they continue to work with others to secure uh, an agreement which would allow the, part, the government to recommend the acceptance of an LCM by this Parliament and to thereafter withdraw any bill that is being progressed? Minister. Very simply, yes. That is the preferred option. I take Mr. Mr. Harvey's point that the consent of the Chamber will be required uh, to withdraw the bill. But yes, that is the preferred option. That's what I said in my statement. That's what I continue to say. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister confirm that in his statement he said that the new proposals from the UK Government to amend the EU withdrawal bill included a provision to consult the devolved administrations before any devolved powers were constrained? Can you also confirm today the Scottish Government will never recommend consent to a bill that gives the UK Government the unilateral right to, to grab whatever powers it chooses in the areas of EU law? And will the Minister also agree with me that they either agree with the principles of devolutions established after the, the, the referendum in 1997 or you don't? There is no middle road, there is no third way, and there is no fudge in regard to protecting the powers of this Scottish Parliament as well as the interests of the Scottish people. Minister. I have always found it virtually impossible to disagree with Bruce Crawford on this occasion. Uh, the, the, you could not put um, the proverbial cigarette paper between us on that issue. There is no question of us agreeing to any diminution of the Parliament's powers. Indeed, I, I want to say I heard it put very forcibly the same point by Mark Drakeford at the JMC last week. We made it clear that he could not envisage circumstances in which the First Minister of Wales went to the National Assembly of Wales and told the National Assembly that powers which they had had since the start of devolution were to be taken away unilaterally and that there had been a consultation. They'd said they didn't want them taken away, but they were going to be taken away anyway. I cannot imagine the First Minister of Scotland agreeing to that. In fact, I know she wouldn't. Claire Baker to be followed by Mary Goujon. Uh, thank you. I share the Minister's preference for an agreement with the UK Government for an amendment to the Withdrawal Bill, which protects the devolution settlement. And given the ruling from the PO contradicts the Lord Advocate, the alternative we are faced with is not straightforward. Next week, Scottish and Welsh governments meet with the UK ministers to discuss amendments, while well, the Parliament's focus will be on the passage of this bill. How will the Parliament be informed of the debate and the detail around the amendments while we are focusing on the legislation that has been introduced? Minister. I, I think it will be possible for us to look both ways, uh, to focus very much on ensuring that we take this issue forward, because the encompassing issue is the same issue. The encompassing issue is the necessity to have arrangements in place for that infinitely regrettable uh, moment which the UK government seemed hell-bent on achieving, which is to leave the EU, which is beyond all common sense or reason. But we are focused upon that and having our law in a suitable state for that moment. So we, it is po possible for us to have a twin-track approach to that, to try and find a way to do so, because the outcome in the end has to be the same. 
we have to have the statute book in that, those, uh, that right way in order to do that. So in order to get the statute book in the right way, we can either have a legislative consent motion so that the UK bill covers both devolved and reserved matters, or we can have two bits of legislation, one of which deals with devolved and one of which deals with reserved. That's the choice. That's what we're trying to work our way towards. And in the end, that's the decision that will have to be made. Mary Goujon to be followed by Donald Cameron. I note the comments from Welsh First Minister Carwin Jones today around protecting devolution. Can the Minister outline how he intends to work with other devolved administrations to ensure that the powers that already lie in Cardiff and Holyrood aren't diminished? Minister. Um, we have been working very closely with the Welsh Government and I want to uh, give my thanks both to, to, to Carwin Jones and to Mark Drakeford in particular for the very close relationship that has built up. Mark and I have spent a very considerable amount of time in, in quite a lot of different places uh, over the last uh, uh, year or so uh, trying to take these issues forward and we'll continue to do so. It is a matter of great regret that there is no Parliament or Assembly in Northern Ireland at the present time where I think the voice that we should be hearing from Northern Ireland uh, is a voice that would be significant in this debate. Now there will, would be a difference of opinion there but at the very start of the JMCEN process the Northern Irish members were uh, Martin McGuinness and uh, Arlene Foster and there was a balanced view coming from those two people, and they were contributing very, very importantly to the proceedings of JMCEN. Uh, that came to an end after the collapse of the administration, as a result of which only civil servants have been present um, at the JMCEN from that side of the house, and it's not been the same. Uh, it would be great to have uh, uh, the, the, the Northern Ireland government back, and that would provide a significant input. But we'll continue to work very strongly with Wales, and our interests in these matters are identical. We cannot accept a diminution of devolution, and we will not accept a diminution of devolution. Donald Cameron to be followed by Richard Lockhead. Thank you. Um, we've heard a lot in recent months from all quarters about the need to respect the devolution settlement, a sentiment the Scottish Conservatives fully endorse. But how can the Minister be satisfied that the continuity bill he proposes today respects that settlement, not least in light of the presiding officer's statement that the bill is at with the legislative competence of this parliament. Minister. Well, I think, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to bandy uh, legal opinion with uh, an advocate who is far better uh, qualified to argue this case than I am. Uh, but I, I have to say that I, 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 call in, uh, I call in my defense the Lord Advocate, who may slightly trump Mr. Cameron in that sense. I use the word trump in the old sense, not in the new sense, I have to say. I would never suggest that. Um, and, and therefore, you know, I, this is a perfectly legitimate and reasonable step to take. And indeed, I, I, I note in the presiding officer's own opinion, he accepts that this is a perfectly reasonable and legitimate s step to take, which is to say that there is a genuine difference of opinion. The difference of opinion lies between the Lord Advocate's view and the presiding officer's view, and the Welsh presiding officer has taken a view much more in accordance uh, with the Lord Advocate's view. And in those circumstances, there is absolutely nothing wrong with moving in this way. And indeed, as I've tried to indicate in my statement, it is the right thing to do democratically because it allows, it allows this chamber to make the decision. Now, there are one or two Tory members who are muttering about the prospect of this chamber making the decision, but I would seem, unless you don't like basic democracy, that that is something that is worth doing. And therefore, and therefore, therefore, these ideas will be put to the test and we will have a vigorous debate, I'm sure, at stage one, stage two, and stage three, and I look forward to it. Richard Lockhead to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Given that the, the current Conservative UK government posed the biggest threat to Scottish devolution since this parliament was reconvened in 1999, and given the enormity of the issues at stake for Scotland uh, and our economy, can I offer my support to the Minister's proposal to bring the continuity bill to Parliament, but can I also ask him to pay attention to negotiations across the Irish Sea? Because I know that on the one hand he'll want to support the Good Friday Agreement and the spirit of that agreement, but on the other hand, pay close attention to whether the UK Government are willing to give special trade arrangements to the Republic of Ireland that could place the Scottish economy at a competitive disadvantage if we're not given a deal in terms of market access to the European market. Minister. Yes, um, I certainly think that the issue of, of Ireland and the Irish border is not only vitally important but will loom very large in, our, in considerations this week. I mean, this is, uh, uh, in, as ever, Brexit is a fast-moving issue, but this week we've had David Liddington and Jeremy Corbyn on Monday and 
uh, whilst one speech was deeply unacceptable, the other one, I think, was moving in the right direction, as I've said uh, publicly. Um, we have uh, a variety of things happening today, including the introduction of these continuity bills in Wales and Scotland. Tomorrow, we have the legal text, the draft legal text, coming from the EU, which will deal with the uh, Northern Irish situation, amongst others. And I suspect that will be a, a very problematic moment uh, for the UK government in particular, particularly if you believe that the Northern Irish border is akin to that between uh, uh, Camden and Islington or Camden and Westminster, which is such a mind-bogglingly stupid thing to have said that it is impossible to believe that a UK Foreign Secretary actually said it. But the reality of the situation is that that is an issue which will arise tomorrow. And then towards the end of the week, we have the Prime Minister who uh, is apparently taking, making a speech about her ideas for uh, the, the next stage of the EU negotiating process, as those ideas appear to be based upon a set of proposals which the UK, which the EU has already rejected, that may also lead to some interesting conclusions. Uh, we will continue to take forward what we believe is correct in this very sensitive and difficult time, but of course we support a peaceful resolution of the situation in Northern Ireland, a resolution that supports a Good Friday Agreement, a resolution, however, that does not also create circumstances in which Scotland would be actively disadvantaged. And we say that not for pro forma reasons, but because that is also has to be true in terms of how we work with others. There are five more members still wish to ask a question. I'm conscious of time, but with the Minister and the members' uh, assistance, in other words, brevity, we'll try and get them all in. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you. The continuity bill is clearly no ordinary government bill. It is being brought forward by the government but it seeks to protect the interests of this Parliament. And therefore, I'm sure the Minister will agree with me that maintaining cross-party confidence in it is vital. So in that context, and given the, the uh, uh, decision by the presiding officer regarding competence, will the Minister commit to a formal cross-party body, like those we have established in this chamber, such as the Bureau and the corporate body, to manage and oversee the passage of this bill, rather than it being the purview of a particular Minister, or indeed the Government? Yes. Um, no, I think that's an impractical solution because I can't imagine what that would be and the time it would take to set it up. The, the Bureau and the other institutions are established by law, they're part of the Scotland Act. Um, I, I don't think it's a practical solution, but I have, and I don't want to be difficult, I have indicated my answer to Neil Finlay, and I'll indicate my answer to Daniel Johnson too. I am keen for cross-party discussion and, 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 and work to continue, and I'm happy that that is as broad and as deep as other members wish it to be. So I'm happy to make sure that we are endeavouring to work as a parliament to make sure that this is taken forward. But this is a government bill. Uh, the law also requires a definition of bills, if I seem to remember from my days on the Bureau, uh, to be other government bills or other bills. And as this is a government bill, I think it'd be a bit late to change horses in midstream on that. But um, in these circumstances, we'll work closely with other um, uh, MSPs and with other parties, and I want to do so, and I put that on record. Christina McKelvey to be followed by Ivan McKee. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister confirm that what is at issue in this dispute over the EU withdrawal bill is what happens to the existing powers of this Parliament, not, as has been suggested by others, a new powers bonanza. It's about the powers of this place. Yes. Absolutely. I used the word in my statement, the existing powers. Christina McKelvey is absolutely correct. This is not about uh, additional powers. This is not about new powers. This is about the powers which we have and which would be underlined, undermined, very much undermined, by the process the UK government is going through. We are talking about defending the powers of this parliament, the existing powers of this parliament. And that should, in the light of the question from Daniel Johnson uh, particularly, that should unite all of us and find a way to work together to do that. Ivan McKee to be followed by Neil Bibby. Uh, thank you. Does the Minister agree with me that it is ridiculous for the UK Government to cite risks to economic stability as a reason to override the devolution settlement, given the huge damage their own secret analysis shows will be done to Scotland's economy by the hard Brexit they are pursuing? Minister. I do. But I, I would just add that the, the real issue in here, in terms of, uh, of, 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 of what is at risk, is an attempt by the UK government to present something as existing which doesn't exist. There is no single market in the UK as they have presented. There is a, a uniform market, we do all trade together, but we have different arrangements when those are required and when the powers of this parliament or the powers of the Welsh Assembly uh, make it necessary to do so. And minimum unit pricing is a really classic example of that. 
and therefore we should, be, we should recognize that this is not unitary but uniform and we should work accordingly. Neil Bivy to be followed by Alec Neil. The Minister will be aware that Professor Alan Page of the University of Dundee has suggested that so-called standstill provision with the UK Government and devolved administrations agree not to exercise powers in the absence of a common framework may offer a temporary solution to Clause 11. In light of these latest developments, has the Minister given any further consideration to Professor Page's suggestion of standstill provisions? And does the Minister now consider them a pragmatic alternative to Clause 11 that could potentially negate the need for a continuity bill? Minister. I am familiar with Professor Page's proposal. I think he himself was going a little cold on it subsequently because there are some substantial problems in standstill proposal. That type of voluntary restriction upon the powers of parliaments um, would only work if everybody was working together and we've seen no indication the UK government would do so. And indeed, in terms of our powers, we would also have to say what happens when we need to exercise those powers. For example, in, in, uh, when you're dealing with certain agricultural issues or an outbreak of agricultural disease. I think standstill seems an attractive idea, just as sunsetting seemed an attractive idea, but there are some very substantial difficulties with it. I very briefly talked to Professor Page about it. I'd always be happy to do so again but I think it's not as realistic an option as appeared to be when it was first suggested. I think in evidence to the Finance and Constitution Committee, I think that he gave some evidence to the committee. And Alec Neil. Thank you very much indeed, the presiding officer. Given the Lord Advocate's very welcome ruling, will the minister give a guarantee that if the UK government or any other body mounts a challenge to the legality of this bill in the courts, that the Scottish government will fight any such challenge tooth and nail uh, to ensure that we can pass this legislation legitimately. Minister. I don't think I should commit the Scottish Government to, to legal action, nor should I commit the Lord Advocate, but it sounds to me the type of question the Lord Advocate would be well placed to answer tomorrow. However, I can't imagine the position that we've taken weakening in any way, and therefore you can draw your own inference from that. Thank you. That concludes our statements and questions. Point of order, Mike Rumbles. Order under Rule 9.21 of our Standing Orders entitled Emergency Bills. In the statement just now, the Minister stated that the Minister for Parliamentary Business has written to you proposing an emergency timetable for this bill, which will be put to the Bureau. He also said that the shortened timetable proposes that all stages of the bill take place in plenary session. Nowhere in the statement, and I listened carefully, nor in the question and answer session, did the Minister say if this bill is to be considered as an emergency bill under Rule 9.21? Rule 9.214 states that the requirements in Rules 9.53a to 9.53c as to minimum periods that must elapse between stages of a bill shall not apply. However, this only applies to an emergency bill. Otherwise, Rule 9.53a states that the minimum period that must elapse between the day on which Stage 1 is completed and the day on which stage two starts is 12 sitting days, and rule 9.53b states that there should be 10 sitting days between stages two and three. This is important for the proper scrutiny of legislation because the convention we have established in this parliament is that an emergency bill has all party support. An emergency bill has never been taken forward by any government without all party support. And indeed, we are in new territory here, as we all accept, as for the first time you have certified that this government bill is not within the legislative competence of our parliament. So, presiding officer, I am looking to you for guidance from you as to whether or not this is an emergency bill and a shortened timetable can be used, providing there is all party support, or whether this is not an emergency bill and the rules and conventions we have here for proper scrutiny should be adhered to. I seek genuinely your guidance. Can I thank Mr Rumble for his point of order and advance notice and I can confirm that until the Parliament decides it's an emergency bill, it's not an emergency bill. However, I would for, first of all point out that under Rule 9.21, any member of the Scottish Government or junior Scottish Minister may propose that a Government bill be treated as an emergency bill. I can also confirm that the Minister for Parliament, Mr Fitzpatrick, has already written to me this afternoon uh, asking for a meeting of the Bureau and I've agreed and called a meeting of the Parliamentary Bureau for after decision time this evening so that we can decide that this matter this evening. It will then be up following a decision of the Bureau. That proposal will be put to the Parliament and it'll be up to the Parliament, up to you, all of you as members, to decide whether or not to treat this as an emergency bill. 
And I can suggest also for that point that it does not require a unanimous decision. I hope that answers the question. Uh, now, before we come to decision time, uh, the next item of business is actually consideration of a business motion uh, 10729 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau, setting out a revised business programme for tomorrow. I would ask any member who objects to say so now. I would call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 10729. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No one's asked to speak against it. Therefore, the question is that we agree motion 10729. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And we come now to decision time. The first question is that amendment 10652.1 in the name of Miles Briggs, which seeks to amend motion 10652 in the name of Aileen Campbell on developing a Scottish healthy weight strategy be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next question is that motion, that, sorry, the amendment 10652.3 in the name of David Stewart, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Aileen Campbell be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 10652 in the name of Aileen Campbell, as amended on developing a Scottish healthy weight strategy, be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Rachel Hamilton. We'll just take a few moments for members and the ministers to change seats.